we're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or, or, or less. The economy is in a huge mess. Jim Rickard said that this is the best single indicator of a recession. An inverse yield curve is when a yield on a 30-year bond is lower than a 10-year bond. Simply put, you get more money by saving it in less time. Normally, you should get more money when you save it for longer because the risk is bigger. You have to wait for more time in order to get your money back. But instead, investors prefer the shorter bond because they're afraid that the economy might be in a recession, meaning that the economy is slowing down. Jim Rickard said that there are at least three markets, the stock market, the bond market, and the real market. If the economy is in a recession, stocks and bond markets usually know it later, but the real market knows it first. When the sales go down, they have to cut costs. And eventually, they have to fire their employees. Entrepreneurs and small businesses know it best when it comes to the state of the economy because I believe that Jerome Powell never bought groceries by himself. So, how could interest rates go up if we're in a recession? The fact is that the interest rate is a lagging indicator. Let Jim Rickards explain it to you. Interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. They see it. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, it's a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause, clause adverse change clauses kicking in. I said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. Uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks. Bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. And then there's what I call the reality. What I see is, is a kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over-tightened. They're going to keep going for the reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, p p attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at look at a chart, uh, any stock index chart from October 1st, 2018 to, to December 24th, 2018. The stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it was like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when it dropped, I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. Now, here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. And that's the key word. It's not if stocks are going down, but it's you know, kind of a little, you know, half a percent a day, one percent a day, trending down, 
lower highs, lower lows, trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008, I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, uh, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. Jim Rickard said that the Federal Reserve will only care enough if it's a disorderly collapse, meaning if the markets, either stocks or bonds, are going down like 30% in just two weeks. If it's just a little plunge in a day like a 5% drop in Amazon stocks then the Fed won't care about it. But what the Fed and everybody is missing is the state of the economy itself. The unemployment rate is at its worst now, and massive layoffs in the tech industry are in the news everywhere. Because of what, you might ask? Yes, you are correct, it's because of the high interest rates. The companies need to pay more for the interest on their debt, so they have to reduce their headcount. At the same time, their revenue decreased because consumers unsubscribed from their services because of the rising prices everywhere, whether it's groceries, gas, or even food. So yeah, everything will go south I guess. Now here's what the Fed is uh, is missing, or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer, entrepreneur, and you're in any kind of distress, you know, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. You'll, you know, be late on the rent. You'll turn down the lights, you know, you know, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes. Um, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. Like, oh, I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. So that, and then combine that with what I just said about severance and, you know, rolling terminations, et cetera. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number's going up this spring. But that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, um, that unemployment's a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% yeah. on an annualized basis, 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation's 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points. Because when, when, the, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake. But you have to know that they're nominal and you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is real wages have been going down for a couple of years because um, they're, they're, it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like a hey, 5% raise, what, what do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8 9% inflation or even 6% inflation, um, your real wage is going down. So that's not a, a robust number at all. The Fed, by the way, the Fed wants to make, make it worse. The Fed agrees that uh, those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That, that's, that would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and, and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. Uh, but if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's that's another issue. Now, what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but uh, there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. It's all, it's all you do. It's not sophisticated. Um, and that number today is around 61.2, uh, 61 give or take, uh, percent. But as recently as um, 2000, that, that number was over 70%. Uh, and it has come down ever since, and it's, it dropped like a stone during uh, 2020, during the pandemic lockdown. Came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population, not working. You're, um, you're a homemaker. You're a, a student. You know, there's, there's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70 is pretty high and 60 is pretty low. Uh, so and the, the trend has been down. So that leaves uh, relative to kind of a normalized number that leaves about eight to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you throw if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers, the way they've 
Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And yeah. that's, a, that's a depression level of unemployment. 